There's a story about a white unionist in the South whose support for newly freed blacks angers his neighbors. They come over one night and basically tell him to shut up. When he refuses, they take him outside, tie him to a tree, and horsewhip him. And they tell him if they have to come back again, they're going to hang him from that same tree. But the man had nowhere to turn because the South at this time was a place of lawless tyranny. The 14th Amendment was designed to stamp out that tyranny by requiring government officials to respect the basic civil rights of all Americans. The period following the Civil War was marked by shocking abuses of individual rights and by a constitutional amendment, the 14th Amendment, designed to halt those abuses. The seeds of those events were contained in our founding documents, including the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was a promise of limited government based on individual rights and the ideals of the Enlightenment. And the story of the American Constitution, and especially the 14th Amendment, is really the story of our trying to live up to that promise. Of course, the lofty ideals in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution cannot be reconciled with the abomination of slavery, the tacit approval of which set us on a path to disaster from day one. The Constitution's failure to resolve the question of slavery gave rise to a furious national debate. Some people, like Senator John Calhoun, argued that the Constitution's references to slavery amounted to a tacit endorsement. Others, like the radical legal scholar Lysander Spooner, argued exactly the opposite, that the Constitution presumed all men were free, making slavery impossible. So in public, there were two sides. The anti-slavery camp, arguing that the Constitution presupposed that people were free, and that this was totally irreconcilable with the idea of slavery. And you had the pro-slavery camp, arguing almost exactly the opposite. Unfortunately, in the courts, the pro-slavery side won an almost unbroken series of victories. For example, anti-slavery activists had argued that the Bill of Rights automatically bound the states. But the Supreme Court rejected that position in a case called Barron v. Baltimore, holding that the Bill of Rights only affected the federal government. Later on, in a case called Dred Scott v. Sanford, the court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roger Taney, not only rejected the anti-slavery position that the Privileges and Immunities Clause in Article 4 protected individual rights, but actually went so far as to hold that the black man had no rights that, quote, the white man was bound to respect. Over the course of the debates about slavery in America, what you really see is a movement that started out as an anti-slavery movement really changed into a movement much more radical and much more broadly devoted to the protection of natural rights, ranging from free speech to the right to control one's own labor. Part of that is due to the influence of intellectuals like Lysander Spooner or Joel Tiffany, but part of that is just a reaction to the horrible abuses of natural rights that abolitionists saw in the pre-war South and immediately after the Civil War. In the aftermath of the Civil War, newly freed blacks were systematically terrorized, disarmed, and even lynched for asserting their right to equality and individual liberty. The stories of violence perpetrated against newly freed blacks are truly horrifying. For example, Robert Church, a black entrepreneur in Memphis, Tennessee, actually one of the first major black entrepreneurs anywhere in the Reconstruction South, owned a saloon and several other businesses around Memphis. He was wildly successful, he was beloved by the community, and in 1866, an angry mob of white people, largely led by members of the local police force, broke into his saloon, dragged him into the street, shot him, and left him for dead, all because he was in a business they thought a black man shouldn't be in. By the time Congress convened in 1866, anti-slavery Republicans dominated both houses. Led by men like John Bingham in the House, along with Senators Charles Sumner and Jacob Howard, radical Republicans enjoyed complete control of Congress. They have the power to amend the Constitution, and they are determined to use it. They were faced with an unending series of abuses in the Reconstruction South. State and local governments had responded to the new 13th Amendment ban on slavery by trying to deprive newly freed slaves and their white supporters of any meaningful freedom especially economic freedom. Economic liberty, the right to pursue a livelihood of your own choosing and to keep the money you earn, was the opposite of slavery, 
and the real opportunity for freed slaves to lead a free life. The pro-slavery forces knew this. So in the South, freed slaves weren't just banned from pursuing particular occupations, but in some places, it was actually illegal for black people to leave their employer's property without written permission. In others, breaking a labor contract was punished by whipping. The 14th Amendment was supposed to stop rights violations like these. One of the rights most frequently mentioned in connection with the 14th Amendment was the right to keep and bear arms. Congress was well aware of the fact that newly freed blacks and white Union soldiers were being systematically disarmed throughout the South in order to subjugate and terrorize them. For example, Congress heard testimony about a town in Kentucky where the town marshal was, quote, very prompt to take arms away from all of the returning black soldiers and to shoot them whenever the opportunity arose. The 14th Amendment was proposed in response to this wholesale violation of civil rights, as embodied, for example, in the notorious Black Codes. The architect of the 14th Amendment, John Bingham, was a learned and well-respected lawyer from Ohio. Bingham actually appears to have been one of the few members of Congress who understood that by virtue of the Supreme Court's decision in Barron v. Baltimore, the Bill of Rights did not apply directly against the states. In fact, Bingham had to bring a copy of Barron onto the floor of the House to prove that the Bill of Rights had no effect against the states. John Bingham believed there was a hole in the original Constitution, which was that it didn't give the federal government the power to protect individual rights from interference by the states. The 14th Amendment was Bingham's effort to fix that. The 14th Amendment protects three distinct interests, due process, equal protection, and the privileges or immunities, meaning rights, of United States citizens. Of those three, privileges or immunities are by far the most important because that clause protects individual rights from government infringement. In 1872, the Supreme Court had its first opportunity to interpret the Privileges or Immunities Clause in a case called Slaughterhouse. Handed down in 1873, the Slaughterhouse cases essentially read the Privileges or Immunities Clause out of the 14th Amendment. In the Slaughterhouse cases, Justice Samuel Miller, writing for a bare majority of the court, held that the Privileges or Immunities Clause protected only a limited and relatively trivial set of so-called rights of national citizenship, such as the right to access navigable waterways and federal sub-treasuries, and to invoke the protection of the federal government when on the high seas. This was an utterly absurd reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. No one thinks we fought a civil war and amended the Constitution because someone somewhere had difficulty accessing a sub-treasury. And no one thinks that today. There is virtually unanimous agreement among constitutional scholars that the Slaughterhouse Majority's interpretation of the Privileges or Immunities Clause is completely indefensible. Taking their cue from the Supreme Court's refusal to enforce the 14th Amendment consistent with its text, purpose, and history, the states responded by expanding the existing black codes into the formal caste system of Jim Crow. Blacks and whites alike were subject to a host of regulations designed to prevent newly freed blacks, or freedmen as they were called, from becoming economically self-sufficient members of society. This unrelenting assault on liberty finally forced the Supreme Court to reconsider its understanding of the 14th Amendment. Having effectively eliminated the Privileges or Immunities Clause as a meaningful part of the Constitution, the court eventually began protecting individual rights through a doctrine called substantive due process. That has a historical pedigree that dates back to the Magna Carta, but the Supreme Court's use of substantive due process to do a job for which the Privileges or Immunities Clause was designed has resulted in a patchwork and incomplete jurisprudence of liberty. Some rights the 14th Amendment was supposed to protect, like freedom of speech, ended up protected anyway. But others, like economic liberty or the right to own a gun, just got ignored and waved away. On any fair reading, there is not the slightest doubt that the 14th Amendment protects an individual right to own a gun for self-defense. So why did it take the Supreme Court nearly 150 years to recognize that right, and then by a margin of only one vote, 
The Second Amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Despite that clear language, it took a carefully planned public interest lawsuit, which I helped design and litigate, District of Columbia v. Heller, to finally persuade the Supreme Court to interpret the Second Amendment as protecting an individual right to own a gun. But because the District of Columbia is a federal jurisdiction to which the Bill of Rights applies directly, Heller left open the question of whether the 14th Amendment protects the right to own a gun from interference by state and local officials, and if so, how? That was the question the Supreme Court took up two years later in McDonald versus City of Chicago. Faced with this question in McDonald, the Supreme Court split into three camps. Four of the justices wanted to use the traditional substantive due process method to find that the right to keep and bear arms was fundamental and should therefore be applied against the states. Another group of four justices wanted to use substantive due process to say that the right to keep and bear arms was not fundamental and therefore shouldn't apply. The deciding fifth vote fell to Justice Clarence Thomas. Justice Thomas makes such a powerful case for the Privileges or Immunities Clause in his McDonald concurrence that none of the other justices, in the plurality or the dissent, challenge his reading of the relevant history or his conclusion that the right to own a gun is a privilege or immunity of American citizenship. The 14th Amendment, and especially the Privileges or Immunities Clause, was a really radical change to the Constitution. It was supposed to give the federal government, and especially the federal courts, the power to protect rights that had been historically trampled by state and local governments. One of these fundamental rights was the right to earn an honest living. But for its entire existence, the Privileges or Immunities Clause has been a dead letter. McDonald starts to change that. In the wake of McDonald, the Privileges or Immunities Clause is relevant, is alive, in ways it simply hasn't been since it was adopted. And in coming years, as law students sit down to read the different opinions in McDonald, it's going to become clear that only one of those opinions really tries to grapple with the constitutional history, really tries to grapple with the role the 14th Amendment plays in our constitutional structure. And that's going to make an enormous difference. The 14th Amendment was a promise. It was a promise to the people of this country of limited government and respect for individual rights. But that promise was broken almost immediately by the Supreme Court's redaction of the Privileges or Immunities Clause from the 14th Amendment. The Institute for Justice has been working for 20 years to restore the Privileges or Immunities Clause, to restore the concept of individual liberty to its proper place in the Constitution and its proper place in our society.